I am Sarab Zavaleta of the Foreign Press Association. We welcome you to celebrate with us um, International Women's History Month and the Asian Art Week in New York City. We are also thinking of the women in Ukraine who are having a very difficult and tragic time keeping themselves and their families safe. We are with you. Today, we have Joshin Oberoi here with us. She is vice president and sales director of the DAG Gallery. She has organized a very exciting exhibit of women Indian artists to honor them and also to honor the Asian Art Week. So Joshin, we invite you to walk us through this wonderful exhibit that you have organized. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this podcast, Sarah. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk about our current exhibition, uh, which is A Place in the Sun, Women Artists from 20th Century India. Uh, the reason we're very excited to present this exhibition at this time um, are two, twofold. One, of course, is, as you mentioned, it is Asia Week in New York. This is an annual feature event that takes place every year in March where galleries, museums, institutions, auction houses across New York City come together over a period of 10 days and do a lot of programming and exhibitions that present uh, Asian art of every region from antiquities all the way to modern. And modern is really what DAG focuses on. So I think that's a great opportunity for people interested in that, in that area to really explore the city and the galleries at this time. Um, and DAG is also participating uh, in this event. The, the most exciting reason for me really is that March is Women's History Month. And DAG has been in New York. Um, the New York space has been here for um, seven years now. And we've frequently been asked this question of who are the women artists working in Indian modernism? Uh, and we've always had representations, but nothing very substantial. And I think we realize that there is a paucity of space and there is a lack of uh, representation in the West of the um, richness of Indian women artists who were working in India through the 20th century. And this is a perfect time to really bring this exhibition here. Also, because I think we, I think we can all agree that across disciplines, across geographies, not only in India, we find that women are underrepresented, underrepresented and underacknowledged. Um, the work is there. There is excellence in what they were producing, but we're not really seeing that being exhibited and acknowledged to the extent it should be. So this is our little attempt um, and contribution to rectifying that. Now the exhibition here will have, um, we're, we're bringing eight artists, uh, the exhibition has 10 artists, but in our space, we'll be exhibiting eight of those 10 artists. And uh, that runs the gamut from abstraction to figuration. Um, the oldest artist in this exhibition was born in 1910 and passed away in 2000. Um, the youngest was born in 1958 and lives and works in India still. And so what we're really trying to present is the diversity of work being produced. You know, for anyone who walks into the gallery and sees the exhibition, there, there will be no uniformity. Each of them has a very unique language, a very unique style and their own concerns. There is no monolithic concern with whether it's feminism or socio-political issues. Those are the questions they're all grappling with, but they're doing it in their very, very personal styles and visual languages. And um, I, I think that, you know, DAG, like I said, has um, been here since 2015. And I think this is the first time we're really presenting an exhibition entirely dedicated to women artists. Um, and just to give the viewers a little context, um, DAG was established in 1993 in Delhi, which is where our flagship space still exists. And we, our, our, our founder, Ashish Anand, has really built um, a remarkable collection of Indian modern art over these past 25 years. And the focus of the gallery has always been Indian modern art. So we are very committed to re-establishing and recognizing modern masters of Indian art history, many of whose legacies had really been lost and there was a danger of, lo of losing the archives um, of these great artists and modern masters. 
And this very research and documentation focus approach is also what you will see in our current exhibition. So walk us through the uh, women artists that you're exhibiting. Sure, of course, I'd be happy to. Uh, maybe I can just do one, um, sort of one or two images or works of each artist and um, just sort of walk you through and show you a sample of what we, what we have in the gallery. Um, so I think I'd love to start with Devyani Krishna. She is the oldest artist from, our, from this group. Uh, she was born in 1910 and she was both a painter and printmaker. So the work you see on the screen was made in 1951. Uh, she and her husband, who was also an artist, traveled extensively in India, um, and especially in the Himalayan frontiers. And so she was very interested and invested in um, Tibetan and Buddhist iconography and uh, rituals and performances that she saw. So what you see actually is in the, the state of Sikkim in Northeast India, um, this, the, the use of masks to really um, play out the life and times of, um, of a Buddhist uh, spiritual figure. And so you see really an owl and a pig. And this was something that she rendered beautifully, um, as you can see on the screen, um, and so powerfully on, on, um, on paper. The second work I am showing you is from 1984. So the, the one I just showed you was from 1951, and this one is from 1984. It's a print, it's a viscosity on paper. And what the uh, work is incredible is because it's really showing sort of um, an, an underwater scene of a fish where the, um, where the, you, you can see the outside of the, the skin of the, of, of, the, of the animal, but also the, uh, the skeletal structure. And again, done so beautifully in a print to achieve these layers of color and texture and still be so sort of delicate in how she's uh, produced it is, is quite incredible. Uh, the next artist is Madhvi Parekh. Um, you can actually see some of her works behind me as well. Um, the work I have up on the screen is um, called Kuru. It's from 1961. So Madhvi was born in 1942. She lives and works in, in Delhi currently. And um, this work from 1961 was made just three years before she, uh, since she actually started uh, painting. She's entirely self-taught um, and her husband is an artist, which is what started her on this journey as well. And her language is entirely invented. I think if you look at her work, this is um, an encapsulation of her village life, the innocence, the daily rituals, all captured within this figure called Guru, you know, which translates to teacher or leader. And um, this is the this this was sort of the harbinger of the kind of language and work she has been doing for the rest of her uh, since since ever since. Um, it's very imaginative. Um, it's imbibed a lot of the traditional rural scenes and folk traditions and folk motifs that she grew up with. Um, and then beyond that, she moved into using her own experience of domesticity and, um, and parenthood and um, experiences of traveling. And all of them have come together in this imaginative landscape that is entirely stunning and entirely hers. There is, a, there is there's no reference points beyond what you see on the screen. Um, the next two works I will show are by Shobha Bhatta, um, who was born in 1943, who lives and works in Delhi again. And she is, uh, her, her work is very meditative. There, there is minimalism, abstraction, a great use of color, and she has often used the symbol of Bindu, which is the dot, which is considered the, um, the start of life um, in her works. And I think the two works I'm showing are from 2008 and 2011, where you see her using the Bindu in a very, in, in very specific ways. In, you know, in the purple work, it's the, it's the use of the Bindu as almost creating these pulse points across the canvas. And in the yellow, background work, she used it to create waves. And Shobha is, uh, was a trained musician. So I think people often see the, 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 
the experience of music and waves and that sort of rhythm in her work as well. And she's very committed to paring down forms to their simplest in order to um, experience life and the universe. Um, I'm going to go to Navjot now, who was born in 1949 and um, who lives and works and is based out of Mumbai right now. She was a very politically, she and her husband, again, an artist, were very politically engaged and um, for their entire career. And in the 1970s, when the emergency was declared in India, they, uh, she created a series of works with ink on paper addressing that. So what you see on the screen is this incredibly strong, powerful image of, um, of a man, a powerful man, uh, who seems to be eating another man's skull for supper. And the work is titled Ska Supper. Um, and it's a very, very strong image. So, you know, the work is not large, it's ink on paper, but I think which how she's rendered it has really um, sort of created an impact of, um, of what her political commentary was on what was going on in India at that time in terms of the political emergency um, and, and the... Um, censoring of, um, of the media and, and many other such um, actions. I would like to make a little comment there because yeah. you said Navjot and her husband were very politically involved. Yeah. Um, this painting where a man is sitting and carving a big beef roast. Yeah. Me think it looks like Winston Churchill carving the British empire into slices and enjoying it. That's, that's a great, that's a great observation, uh, Sarab. And yeah, you know, I think that, I mean, we, we can't say for sure if that was, um, but I think that, you know, artists have so many reference points and reference images that, that they do find their way into the work in many different ways. So I, I, it, I, I love that observation because that is essentially what happened. Um, she, know, yeah. she does seem to depict a lot of what happened during the colonial yeah. times. Mm -hmm. She does, she does. Colonial and, and I think post-colonial. So I, because she was such, uh, she was so engaged, um, you know, with, with Marxist movements, with sort of progressive youth movements in the 70s um, and 80s, a lot of her work has sort of continued. And I think really when you, you comment commenting on um, political and sociopolitical issues in India, you know, the origin point comes back to the colonial rule and the colonial period. Um, so I think that's, I mean, it's entirely possible. It's, it's a great, um, it's, it's not what I have noticed, but I think it's a really um, plausible, plausible uh, reference point, yeah. He, he resembles Winston Churchill a lot. In your yes, you're right, um, he does very powerful it's and a very it's a very powerful image yeah um and i mean i think it's you know makes the impact and the statement that that the artist intended um and moving to kogi sarojpal she uh, was born in um 1944 and lives and works in india and her work has um has uh, overtly feminist concerns but in but, or sort of a commentary on how women are tethered to certain roles and uh, within, within sort of the patriarchal system that, that we exist in, in, in India, specifically where, sort of where she lives. Um, and the work you see, you know, these um, grouping of um, women on, on, you know, with a green background, um, you know, can be a commentary on the fact that, you know, women are very affected by uh, superstitions related to the cosmos, to the to the movement the, of the moon and the comets um, and how that really suppresses um, sort of their existence. Uh, so that is what, uh, you know, she's possibly sort of indicating on the, on the screen here. Um, and the second work by her, and so this work is by in 80s, from 1986. The second work called Dancing Horse is from 1995. 1995. Um, and I find this very interesting um, as well. You know, it's work on paper. And uh, I think the idea of, you know, the, the woman with the horse um, uh, sort of as a joint figure is, is frequently used um, 
in, in art and in many visual references. But I think the, her commentary of uh, how women are trained to be like dancing horses. You know, you have horses that are trained in wedding processions in India to, to carry the groom. And I think that sort of subjugation and control and power dynamics is what she is um, indicating in, in this work as well, which I think is a very interesting and a very playful way of condemning really the, the power dynamics and the relationships um, that, that women can be tethered to in the domestic and other spheres in, um, in their life. Again, so it's so Rekha Radvitya's, um, is the youngest artist from this grouping, and she was born in 1958. She lives and works in Baroda in Western India. And a lot of her work has um, changed over the years. The work I'm showing on the screen is from 1986. Uh, so sort of an earlier work, earlier period of, um, her, of her career. And uh, this is the time when there was a lot of conversation about post-colonialism happening in Baroda, where, where she was studying, uh, which was a major art center in India. And she was, um, I think she, she realized in those conversations that women's history and women were not an active part of this um, dissection of post-colonial history and post-colonial effects. Um, and so I think that is something that she's been very sort of concerned and involved with. But I think the, also the idea of um, the layers of society and, and what is fake and what is true and how, how people engage with each other and you know, the questions of trust are all something I, I believe she's really put in this painting, which is a very, very strong, powerful image and, and a large painting, actually. I will next uh, speak about Anupam Sood. Um, uh, and I know Sarab, you've seen some of her work already. Um, she is a master printmaker. She lives and works in Delhi as well. She was born in 1944. And um, the first work I'm actually showing um, is called Couch Potato. And I think this is such a fascinating work because she's really um, sort of subverting the, the, the art historical language over here. You know, the, the image of a woman um, you know, sort of on a, on a couch open to the viewer's gaze is um, the most common trope, I think, in art history. And what she's done here is inverted that. And th there is there's a man lying languidly on, on a couch, uh, staring very smart, very comfortably, uh, looking at the viewer. And she's titled the work, Couch Potato. Um, and I think it's interesting because in one way, she's really opening you know, the, the, the man's body up to our gaze in the same way that women are often subjected um, to that male gaze or to the viewer's gaze. Uh, but she's also titled it Couch Potato, which is a great pun because that is also a comment on how men, um, on men's position and, um, you know, in the domestic sphere and, and, and perhaps sometimes their lack of participation in uh, in, in the daily life of, of their homes. Um, so I think that's really um, sort of great work. Um, I just think that this is very interesting because uh, she may be inspired by some of the Western artists, people like Matisse, Picasso and the others, but it's interesting that she transposes instead of a woman, a man in the same kind of a pose. Yes, exactly. It could, it could be, you know, it could be a sort of a painting a sort of European painting of, of, of any period that, um, that, that you're looking at. So I do, I completely agree. I think it's a very, um, it's a very cleverly done work and it's, you know, just also beautifully uh, made. I think the print, she's such, she's such a master of printmaking that um, just achieved a really fantastic um, work. Um, the second work by her um, is titled Persona. And this is, um, you know, sort of a figure, you know, holding a mask. And I think that's really the idea of um, the many personas that, that the people either choose to or are forced to take in life, including women, many, the many roles and, um, you know, personas that they um, go through in life or at any given time is something she's commenting on. But I think what's interesting is also that she had traveled to Japan and she was very um, interested in Kabuki theater. 
And so I think that the idea of the makeup and the layers um, is something that you also see she has included in, in this particular work. That's brilliant. It's a, it's a really fantastic work. Um, and I'll, I'll finish now with Zarina Hashmi. She is the only artist in this show who lived and worked in New York since the 1970s. She was born in 1937 and she passed away in 2020. Uh, you know, despite living in New York since the 70s, she gained recognition late in her life over the last 10 to 12 years, really. And in 2012, she had a retrospective at the Hammer Museum in LA, and then uh, the, she traveled to the Guggenheim in New York in 2013. And um, what is really been to the, the central focus of her work in many different ways has been the idea of home and, and belonging and borders. Um, because her family, she was born to a Muslim family in Aligarh in India. Um, but then at the, after partition in 1947, her family migrated to Pakistan while she was traveling internationally with her diplomat husband. And so what happened is there's a splintering of the idea of home and, and what is the physical space that you belong to. Uh, and, and especially since she really settled in the third space, like New York, um, which became her home for, for the last decades of her life. Uh, so the works I'm showing up in the 1970s um, a series, she was, she was mostly um, worked with prints, um, also trained in Paris um, with Sammy Hater, with sort of a master printmaker at Atelier 17. And um, she uh, went on to work with woodcuts as well. But a lot of this work is very minimal, very abstract. I think she uh, has abstracted the notion of home and lines and broken homes when you look at these works. Um, sort of they're monochromatic, but they are really talking of um, a loss, a loss of belonging. Yeah, I was, that, mm -hmm. I was wondering because she seems to use um, a lot of black and white and you were talking about the borders. So I guess it has to do with the partition of India. And you wonder what's the black side and the white side. That's right. And I think that always, I mean, I always feel, um, you know, I think for many, many of us whose families have been through partition, um, I, I wonder if that's always a perspective we're in from our perspective defines the black and white, but you are right. Her work has mostly been monochromatic um, for the most part, even her woodcuts um, later in life has, um, you know, she's used, she's worked very little with color. Um, there were different shades of black and white and, um, and cream, but that's primarily been her um, sort of chosen, chosen palette and always, you know, stark um, and, uh, and very moving. Her work is her work is very moving, and I think that is such a universal question of form. And you know, we know what's happening in Ukraine now, and and in, in other parts of the country over the past decades. So I in other parts of the world, sorry, um, uh, in in you know that has been going on uh, since time immemorial. So I think um, it's a very universal question, which is why her work is is very moving for, I think, a very large audience um, and, and has spoken to, um, to, to a very large audience um, in New York and elsewhere. Um, so very, very um, incredible artist um, and who we were lucky to have in New York for many years. Um, so this is just um, you know, a small selection of the works we're presenting. Um, and I do want to emphasize just before I finish here that um, you know, this show is by no means in so, uh, you know, a survey, you know, we're not, we're not attempting to present the, the entire um, sort of gamut. There is an incredibly strong women artists who are working through this time that, that might not be in the show, uh, because like I guess, you know, I mentioned earlier, we really wanted to do justice to the artists we were presenting instead of just doing token few work. So, um, you know, we have a lot of artists who have gained, you know, Amrita Shergill is such a known um, sort of international coveted artist who was their contemporary, but, you know, died young, Deep Prabha, um, Rinalini Mukherjee is an incredible sculptor who had a retrospective at the Metropolitan Museum a few years back. Um, so I think it just, I do want to mention that this is by no means um, 
you know, comprehensive uh, presentation, but it is a selection of, um, of, of some artists we thought really but, needed to be seen. Yeah, a lot, all these artists come from so many different parts of India, which yeah. is and embraces such a diverse population with a very diverse culture and different languages. How do you bring them together? Is there a central point for these artists to come together? That's a, that's a great question, uh, Sarah, because I think that, you know, because there is not a sort of clear understanding, um, you know, outside of India on what constitutes all these sort of um, Indian art and, and these different centers. And, and your observation is right. The uh, traditionally, you know, Mumbai, Delhi, Baroda, uh, Kolkata and Chennai were major art centers. Um, in the 20th century for, for India. And what is interesting is that there is really no, um, at no, at no given time were all these art centers producing similar type of work, which is why, you know, there is such um, a breadth of, of, of Indian modern art to be explored and excavated because, you know, at one point, if, if uh, artists in Baroda had formed a collective um, or a, a group of artists, they had formed a collective where they were experimenting with abstraction and, and using new materials and, and sort of burning paper and doing sort of more folk art, uh, art influenced by folk motifs and traditional uh, motifs, then you had artists in Mumbai, you know, looking a little more West and working with very, very modern iconography. Uh, and so I think to answer your question, there's no one central point um, that brings all of them together. And I think, um, you know, our effort at the AG, and I think for, you know, everybody in the community, um, you know, even beyond us, um, is that we need to document and, and, and archive and present all these different movements that were going on, because there was always, um, you know, a diversity of, um, of visual languages being used and produced. Um, across the country at any given time. And so there's no one um, movement that dominated Indian art at a particular moment in the 20th century or even before, really. But how do you identify the artists in the different parts of the country? You have a team that works on this or? We do have a team actually, yes. So um, it really started with, and I, you know, I mentioned um, our, our founder, um, CEO Ashish and so he it really started with a lot of um, research and study and expertise and and, and traveling and really um, trying to understand you know who was missing in the narrative because you know all of these artists deserve to be in the canon of 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 uh, you know not just Indian art history but and globally you know their work stands on its own um, and, and, and has a place of its own. Uh, but I think it was a lot of um, research really. And but we do have a dedicated team. Um, this show has been curated by the head of our um, exhibitions and publications, uh, Kishore Singh, who is also based in Delhi. And the show has traveled from Delhi um, for that purpose. And we have a team that does research. We have a team that, that does archiving and cataloging of, of artist works. And that is really how we um, are, are creating that archive that making it accessible. Because we do also have a very, very active and robust publication program. Um, we create books that are a mix between coffee table and scholarly academic. Um, so there's a lot of academic scholarly essays and um, information in our in our in our publications uh, but, you know but they are documenting essentially the the art that that was being produced uh, are these these books available in the gallery they are they are available in the gallery yes okay. so joshin thank you you have done a wonderful job and we enjoyed this explanation of these women artists from india and we want to congratulate you for all the things you have accomplished and we hope to see you again you, I want sir. to thank my listeners for being here. I would urge you to please support the Foreign Press Association. Please go to our website as you will see many other things that we have posted and there will be many events also for our listeners. Um, 
And please support us so we can do more events like this for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Pleasure being here. Namaste.